And the whole of MRI and treatment planning. So yes, right up front, I would like to say what I think that for a number of reasons, patients should have MR scans before they see an interventionalist. And there are many reasons for this. The first one is the neurologists want them to have an MR scan. Because you need to see if you have the lesions, the normal lesions. You want to know where those lesions are. And if any treatment regimen is going to work, you want to know if those lesions are in fact stabilizing or going away over time. So from a practical point of view, I would think if I were the patient's neurologist, I would definitely want the MR scan. Because later on, they're going to get scanned again a year later, or two years later, or three years later, to, to make sure that in fact they're, they're doing fine. Um, the other reasons are that MR can give us wonderful three-dimensional information. So this, I hope, will be useful to the interventionalists. Uh, it may help them understand some more complicated geometries that we see sometimes uh, associated with this. Alright, so I assume I have to take this in a different direction. Let's just try this instead. There we go. And, and of course, work like this really it involves a collaboration with many people, and I could list some of them here who have contributed material or sent me slides or, or, or just sent me uh, information that I can use. And at the bottom, including two of my students who worked very hard on, on some of the calculations that I'll show you. Now, for having trouble with this, let's try that instead. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, today a little bit about some of the imaging components for multiple sclerosis and CCSVI. Just a small bit about the role of iron uh, in MS. And then I'm going to show a few slides on perfusion imaging of the brain that talks about um, a technology that allows us to look whether or not there is hypoperfusion and what role that hypoperfusion might play and how it might even demonstrate the vascular link associated with and then a little bit on future directions and the concept of uh, an international database. So in conventional MR, we get these wonderful three-dimensional images, or in this case, a series of two-dimensional slices through the brain that let us take a look at uh, where the lesions are and what the abnormalities are. In this case, you've seen some of these before, but it's just to give you an idea that you know, these lesions tend to be around the ventricles, corpus callosum, sometimes uh, outside of that region, and sometimes they even get into the gray matter. And I think as was said before, there may be seven types of multiple sclerosis lesions. Um, the, the venous system is, of course, quite a complicated system. And it, it's rather interesting that in some of the other work we've done, we've shown that there's roughly 70% venous blood volume, about 20 to 25% arterial blood volume, and maybe 5% capillary blood volume in the brain. So, as you can see, you have you know, three to four times the amount of venous blood volume, which makes sense because if you have very, uh, let's say, a centimeter um, common carotid bringing blood in at the rate of between 20 and 100 centimeters per second, and the blood is only coming out of it on the order of 5 to 20 centimeters per second in the veins, you're going to need roughly four times as many veins to carry that blood out at the same rate that you brought it in. So that's one of the reasons why you have more veins than arteries. Um, this is a, another example in this case of something we call a T1-weighted MRI scan done pre and post contrast. Often the neurologists will look at this because they want to see if there are any new lesions or acute lesions that have developed since the previous time. And, and if there is any leakage of the contrast agent, that's usually a marker of acute lesions. So again, that's one of the advantages that when I show you the MR phenograms that we're going to look at shortly, um, this is something that comes out of this. And at the end of the phenograms, we can recollect this data and also get this information that the neurologist would have wanted anyways. So Zamboni's criteria to, to look at the vascular system are that, uh, is there any evidence, or especially high resolution evidence for stenosis? Is the reflux present? in the internal jugular veins, or no flow? Is the reflux in the deep cerebral veins? Or is there a decrease in the jugular vein cross-section when you change from sitting up to supine? 
because generally speaking, we know from the comments you heard earlier that the vertebral system does most job when I'm standing up here. And if I lie down, the jugulars open up, or at least they should open up, and they provide more of the flow when you're lying down. And in MS patients, it may be that the jugulars can't respond normally, so they don't respond to that change, and <coughs> therefore there are problems that result from it. Not that we really understand the physiology of those problems yet, but we certainly are looking at the macroscopic effects of this. So, uh, here's an example for you on the left hand side, you see uh, the normal venous system for a volunteer. We have nice, patent internal jugular veins. And on the right hand side, you see a, a rather interesting truncular venous malformation. The left internal jugular vein comes down and just stops. Now, there may be, as Sal has pointed out to me, a tiny little stream that that comes from there and might connect to the subclavian. I don't happen to see it here because the resolution that I'm showing you is roughly one cubic millimeter. So I, I, I won't say I can image down to 200 microns with this technique at this point. But one of the things that might be interesting to do in the future is once we think we've found such a stenosis cell, I can actually go back and collect the data with 200 micron resolution locally. So in fact, we could go in and take yet a few more minutes, David, um, to reevaluate local what we think are local stenosis with very high resolution. So MR really offers you this wonderful opportunity. And of course, I don't have to try to find where that catheter is going. I don't have to see, well, am I in the vertebral or am I missing it? And did I really find an internal jugular? Uh, with MR, you can do all of this in three dimensions in, in a reasonable period of time. Now, the other thing that we do is when we a contrast agent is injected, we collect the data over a certain period of time. So we, we, some of the, the data can be collected in seven seconds, at some sites it's 15 seconds. But if you're lucky, you're going to hit the arterial phase first. And the arterial phase, which is the image on the left side, it is very nice because you've captured pretty much all the incoming contrast agent without any confusion with the veins yet. In the middle image, you start to see this confusion with the veins. You also see these upper level uh, narrowings in this case, and these are the ones that, that Sal is suggesting actually may come from a problem that is occurring at, at the confluence of the jugulars with the subclavian and brachiocephalic. Clearly, if you're an interventional person doing this work, you want to start at the valves first and see is there a problem. And then you may find, after you treated those valves, that what we were seeing in MR is, is gone. And in fact, if I re-image somebody and, and look at this again, I may find they're gone too. So Sal, although I wouldn't want to necessarily operate in that area, I would say that it's a good marker that there's something abnormal there. And so this is, I think, useful information um, for the interventionalist. Now you can see the image gets very complicated later on after about a minute and 15 seconds. But here you can begin to see the vertebral plexus very clearly. There's more contrast agent that's made its way into the very slowly moving vessels. And so there's lots of information available to us here, both in time and in space. So I'll show that one already, so I'll move on. Um, and we'll just wait a few seconds. If this doesn't come on, it means it wasn't able to read the movie. That's too bad. So the nice thing is that we can create these 3D uh, movies as well for you to look at, so you can see the entire vasculature. But if the vessel is truly narrow or stenotic, I will see it as a very tiny cross-section or constriction of that, of that vessel. So again, MR does offer you that possibility. But we see quite a variety of things. This is a, a long shoestring-like narrowing of the right internal jugular in this case. Um, I'm going to show you a few examples to, to demonstrate some of the things that you might see um, when you go in to do the treatment. Um, this is a, a more complicated case. Here you can see uh, multiple stenosis, and it's very complicated up by the sigmoid sinus. Uh, sometimes we actually see the, the projection of the beginning of the jugular just veer off to one side and completely stop. And, and the, what would have been the jugular is now fed by part of the vertebral system or alternate veins that actually then will drain out the, the conventional jugular. So again, this three-dimensional information tells you a lot of what's happening at the upper level, the 
might be otherwise difficult for you to see from um, a PTA approach. Uh, this example here, I think, again, is another case, but shows that you can see these upper level or distal stenosis. Um, that could be coming from a problem further down. Sometimes we also see this loss of signal here, which is usually associated with a collapse vein. So that may be a valvular problem. In this individual here on the right, you can see more of a narrowing, in fact, multiple narrowings here. That may or may not be associated with the valvular problem. So even in the, just these first few slides that I'm showing you, we see quite a range of different types of manifestations of these uh, valvular effects, these truncular venous malformations. I think this example here shows a little bit better the case that I was talking about, where you get this stump appearing in the upper right jugular, and then you have other veins that are draining into what was the conventional jugular vein, but nevertheless there are still two more stenosis in that internal jugular. So if you were to go up there with a the catheter, you'd find your way to the top, but you would not be finding your way into the sigmoid sinus. So here you can actually tell from this the type of problems that are taking place. Um, here's a, the opposite example of what I showed you at the beginning. Again, a truncular venous malformation. You can see this just stops here. Um, it's possible there might be a thin string that might make its way up to the sigmoid, and with a catheter you might find that. But one of the things that, that I would suggest, and, and I think Gary Siskin told me that, that he does it this way, that you, you and Gary should correct me if I'm incorrect, um, that you inject initially first before you put the catheter all the way up because, as Sal was showing, if you have a membrane that's blocking the flow and you push the catheter through, you're going to open that membrane. If you have a, a narrowing there and you push the catheter up through it, it may not be quite as narrow as it was, at least in the images that I have. Or you may find that there is just no, no major vessel that continues to the sigmoid here. Now, the case on the right-hand side is particularly interesting because normally, and I talked with Paolo about this, normally you will not see I mean, you will see at least a thin thread going down to the jugular stump. And in this particular case, this uh, narrows significantly and then veers off and joins in with the external jugular. So it does not connect with the truncular, with the, 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 the stump or the truncular venous malformation. So again, what would you have done if you were going in there with a the catheter? So having this three-dimensional information is really valuable. Plus it, it of course, will demonstrate to you things like the enhancement of the vertebral plexus. So in these two particular cases, these people are lucky. They have a very good response in their vertebral system, and they can really carry the blood away well. There are MS patients I've seen where the vertebral system is not well developed at all. So those people who have possible um, truncular venous malformations, who have bad flow, and their venous system cannot carry the blood away, they're likely to be ones that are going to suffer the worst. So my guess is we're going to find we have probably on the order of 20 different manifestations of CCSPI. So if you want to run a really good clinical trial here, double-blinded or not, you're probably going to have to do about 25 cases per characterization of this disease. So in that case, you know, 20 times 25, that's at least 500 you're going to have to do. And, and you know, this is kind of jumping ahead of it, for the people who have been talking about, well, we'll do you know, 50 normals and, and 50 of something else, that's just not going to be good enough. We really need to be merging our data together so that we can create a classification scheme for this now. We don't want to wait five years to produce this classification scheme. Um, here again, you have a similar example I showed you in the beginning. You have a different example here on the right-hand side. In this particular case, it's not a collapsing, it's a narrowing as you approach the, the valve. And so you may find bad valves and truncular effects and narrowing taking place all at the same time. So extremely variable. I'm going to skip this for now. And I want to show you that when we get this 3D data, we collect the data corollary from the back of the head all the way to the front of the face. And so we can go in and pull out different regions of thickness here and focus in on different parts of the vascular system. So you can see on the left-hand side, we can separate out the deep cervical veins. <coughs> And luckily, in many MS cases, these deep cervical veins become very large and they carry away a lot of the blood. Sometimes the vertebral veins will do that. 
Other times you will see clear connections between um, the left and right aspects of the vertebral system. I see this more in MS patients than I do in normal. So all of this information is accessible to me as a means to study the patient before I do the treatment. I don't do the treatment, I meant you as a group of people doing the treatment. So I'm going to skip this a little bit. As you can see, there are, are, are many different um, examples that, that I can go through here. This was a particularly interesting case because here again, depending on how you look at this, if you use very thick slices on the left-hand side, it's kind of hard to see through that vertebral plexus. But as you narrow down and focus in on just a few slices of interest, you can now see more clearly that there's a problem associated with the left internal jugular vein in the upper region. And, and perhaps Sal down at the bottom here, maybe even that confluence is abnormal. I, I can't tell in this case. And this is where we really need comparisons with the, the angioplasty. This is a normal person. Can a normal person have narrowing up in that part? Sure. I mean, that's a pretty uh, a difficult area for the um, vessels to traverse. And if you look at this, you can say, yes, that looks narrow. But you can see the rest of the veins look just fine in that case. Excuse me, I'm going to skip a little bit of this also. Uh, I want to show you this image because it, it shows you that when I think I see a narrowing, I don't just stop and say, okay, that's interesting, it's a narrowing. We take many hours to process this data. We look at it carefully in all orientations. And in this case, we cut through a given region of interest. So for example, in region four, if you look at the orange arrow, you can see a nice cross section for that vessel. If you look at slice three, where I think I don't see anything on the 3D, I, I don't see anything in this case on, on the transverse orientation either. So the nice thing about the transverse orientation is I can follow that vessel all the way from the sigmoid sinus all the way down through carefully one slice at a time. Remember, each of these slices is only one millimeter thick. So it, it's possible I'm missing a half, a half millimeter vessel and there could be thin connections there. But usually if I can't see anything, there's probably nothing there because this technique, using a contrast agent, is able to see things that conventional MR cannot see because the flow is so slow, I couldn't pick it up. In this case, since we're imaging over many minutes, we, we watch this contrast agent change as a function of time. Even those areas with very slow flow will eventually enhance, and I can find them. So if I can't find them with the contrast agent, it means it must be either not there or very slow flow. Um, this was a particularly puzzling case because um, the ultrasound showed there was a stenosis here, the ultrasound showed there was reflux here, and I think the, the young lady who, who um, was involved in that is actually here in the audience. Um, and then we, we had done an MR here and we found what looked like a narrowing. Uh, there may be a thin connection with the upper region. You notice that the, the top yellow arrow shows a bright portion of the jugular vein. And that's because the contrast agent is sitting there, it just couldn't get out. But it's reached equilibrium in every other part of the vascular system. Also with MR, we showed there was reflux here. And yet, when they went in with the catheter, the catheter went up to the top and injected, they found nothing. So the, the conclusion was that, that there wasn't a problem there. And my, my personal feeling is, there's a problem there. So the question is, how you do this procedure may be important. I believe they also used a breath hold when they did this. So they had the person hold the breath and inject it. Um, and in that case, that may change the dynamics of the jugular as well. So my guess is if I were to rescan this person, I'd probably find the same thing the next time I rescan him, unless putting that catheter up there actually affected the blood flow itself. Now we can image the azimuth. Not very well, though. I mean, I'm going to show you one or two examples. Sometimes we're lucky and we get good images like I'm showing you here. Um, you can even see evidence on the right hand side, which is not a particularly good picture, but probably good enough to say I would be concerned about that azimuth. And every once in a while we can even see the hemiazimuth as well, so it's a little bit like out of the textbook. Um, it's not very good here because when we collect this data, the person's breathing, and so these little um, black stripes you see is because the, <laughs> the person is in a different position each time we have collected that 2D slice. The individual slice itself looks very good, but when I try to present it to you in this cross-sectional view, you can see the artifacts associated with it. 
<laughs> Nevertheless, I hope we can continue to improve the ability to do the assays. Now, I want to point out to you that, that um, I, I think ultrasound is important. I think ultrasound will help you look at the valves and the, the valvular function. But I don't think ultrasound is as good as MR in giving you 3D information. I don't think it's even as good as MR in giving you flow quantification. So I want to show you an example of how we do flow quantification in MR. And here we do a cross-sectional image with a resolution of roughly half a millimeter by half a millimeter in plane. So that's pretty high resolution. I can get the cross-section of the vessels extremely well, as you can see on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we measure what we call the phase. And the phase we have made sensitive to the flow. So when you see black here for the um, right internal jugular vein, that means that the flow is going towards the heart. And the white means it's arterial and the flow is going towards the brain. And so we can see these vessels very well. In fact, we're at the point now that maybe in a few months, we will have the, the, the capability to give you the entire cardiovascular input and output to the brain as measured through one slice lens. Now, on the right-hand side here, I'm showing you a plot of what the normal peak velocities would be through some of these veins that we're looking at. And it ranges from 5, 10, 15, on some people maybe even 20 centimeters per second. We can very clearly see that, but we can also integrate that information across the cross-section of the vessel and give you average speeds. We can give you um, total flow per heartbeat, for example. So what I, what I need to tell you is each of the little dots in these plots here represents about 50 milliseconds in the cardiac cycle. So we collect the data roughly 20 times 